Pastor John Randall encourages us to aim for unity in our dealings with others. I have a gift. What is it? Division. Like, <laughs> that's not a good thing in here. Uh, that's not good. But it seems like everywhere they go, there's some divisive thing. It's like it follows them like a, like a trail. Like, hey, what, what happened over here? Oh, so-and-so came over. Where did they go? Oh, they're over there. And then, you, and then it happens there. And then they move. They kind of you know, make their way through the body and, and do these things. And the Bible talks about them. They're called busy bodies. Busy bodies. And they, they like to cause division. God says, I hate division. I hate what it causes. I hate that kind of stuff. And if God hates it, well, surely we should hate it. We need to be united. Well, hi there. Welcome to A Daily Walk. Wouldn't it be incredible to actually hear Jesus pray? Well, you can, and today we'll do just that. The Lord is just a short time from the cross in John chapter 17, and he's just finished addressing his disciples. Now it's time for a conversation with his heavenly Father. Oh, what a joy it is to eavesdrop on this most glorious conversation. And part of his prayer was for us and all future believers. Here's Pastor John Randall. You remember when Jesus confronted Peter, and Peter, on more than one occasion, I think he thought he was better than he was, stronger than he was. He had an inflated opinion of himself that came out in the Gospels. But Jesus, at one point, came to Peter, and he said, Simon, Satan has asked for you that he might sift you like wheat, but I've prayed for you that your faith would not fail. And when you have returned, strengthen your brethren. What a thought. First of all, a little frightening that Satan asked my name, got brought up. Well, what about John? What about him? You know? <laughs> and Jesus said, listen, he's asked, but I'm praying for you. And tonight, the Lord is interceding for us. In the midst of this world, he knows what it's like. He came here and they killed him. He knows what it's like. And so he prays for us. He prays for you. Jesus then said in verse 12, Now while I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those whom you gave me, I have kept, and none of them is lost except the son of perdition that the scripture might be fulfilled. Of course, that is a reference to Judas. Judas, who would betray Jesus for 30 pieces of silver, turn him over to the authorities. Eventually, after he had betrayed Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane with a kiss, later on, he felt bad over the fact that he had done that. He didn't repent, but he came and he took the money and he threw it down at the feet of the religious leaders. And then the Bible says he went out and he hung himself. He committed suicide after what he had done. He was the son of perdition. Interesting, the word perdition means waste. His life was wasted. He wasted his life for what? For nothing. And yet Jesus was aware that there was a traitor in their midst. And at the last supper with his disciples, he revealed that Judas would betray him. And he said, what you do, do quickly. And he went out, the Bible says, and it was night. Satan had filled his heart. Judas had walked with Jesus, seen the miracles of Jesus, heard the teaching of Jesus, but he opened himself up to the enemy, to the devil, to the point that when he actually went through with betraying Jesus, Satan had filled his heart. That's a frightening thing to say. The devil had moved in, in the life of Judas. Or verse 13, but now I come to you and these things I speak in the world that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word. And the world hated them because they're not of the world, just as I'm not of the world. Now, I don't pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Jesus said, listen, they, these guys had a job to do. The final words that Jesus would say to his apostles was go into all the world and preach the gospel to every tribe, tongue, nation. That This would be the great commission. I'm not saying that you take them out of this. Keep them in it, but protect them in the midst of it. They're not of this world. Allow them to be effective. Keep them from the evil one. 
keep them from going astray, keep them from stumbling into sin. You know, when you think about the Lord's Prayer or the disciples' prayer, part of that is, is the prayer of asking to be protected from evil. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Important that we stay away from that which is evil and that we don't run to temptation, but that we run from it. Oh, the Lord will protect us from it, but if you're running headlong into it and he's warned you in advance, stop, bam, 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 don't go there, stop, stop, and then you run right into it. And then, I don't know how this happened. I don't know. I just was there at the bar. It was dark and I got thirsty. Yeah, you know how it happened? You went there. You shouldn't have even been there. What were you doing? You ran to temptation as opposed to, nope, I'm running in the opposite direction of it. Hey, keep them from the evil one. The, the enemy goes about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And so we need to be sober-minded. We need to be on guard. We need to have our armor on because we're not of this world. And Jesus wasn't of this world. Listen, if you're a Christian, you're trying to be of this world. Listen, Jesus wasn't of this world. They didn't want him. They crucified him. In verse 17, he prays, sanctify them. It means to set them apart. How would they be set apart? By your truth. Your word is truth. Here Jesus prayed that his disciples would be set apart for the purposes of God. Are you set apart for the purposes of God? To sanctify means to set something apart for a particular purpose. When you get saved, you are sanctified positionally by the work of the Holy Spirit. You're born again, you're saved, and you are sanctified, set apart in that moment for the purposes of God. Set apart, sanctified pulled out of the kingdom of darkness, placed in the kingdom of light. But also, friends, listen, there is a process called sanctification that the Holy Spirit works in my life and is refining and changing and altering who I was to who he called me to be. Oh, he sets me apart. Hey, that happens. It's a miracle of a moment. Salvation is a miracle of a moment where sanctification is a process of a lifetime. And as I yield to the work of the Holy Spirit in my life, hopefully I look less and less like I used to look and more and more like who Jesus is. That's the goal. That's the intention. That's the purpose. But that's a work of the Spirit. And as I yield to the Lord, that's what he does. So he's praying, sanctify them. And notice how they're sanctified. By your truth. Your word is truth. The word of God also helps us to be set apart. How important is the word of God in the life of the believer? Jesus said, sanctify them by your truth, and your word is truth. Verse 18, as you sent me into the world, I've sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they also may be sanctified by your truth. Jesus sent his disciples into the world. You ever ask yourself, why are we still here? Like, Lord, it would be really great in light of a lot of things happening right now, if you just came, like just trumpet, sound it so we can full send, just, you know, just go, let's go already. Why are you waiting? Why haven't you come yet? Well, the Bible does tell us that he is long suffering, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. We still have a purpose to fulfill. We still have a job to do until the Lord calls us home. He has sent us into the world. Jesus said to his disciples, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest field because the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers, they're few. There's more loiterers than laborers. We need laborers into the harvest field because we have a job to do. God's called us to that. He set us apart for that purpose. And so he said, I sent them into the world sanctify them. And then finally, Jesus prays now for future followers, for believers down throughout the ages. And notice what he prays. Now, I don't pray for these alone, that is the disciples, the apostles, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. This is now looking into the future. I'm praying for them. I'm praying for us and believers throughout the ages. And what is the prayer? Verse 21, that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me, and the glory which you gave me, I've given to them, that they may be one, just as we are one. I in them, you in me, 
that they may be made perfect in one, that the world may know that you've sent me and have loved them as you've loved me. You'll find here that Jesus prays for future believers. One of the things that he prays for is unity, that they would be one. I mean, you just think about the 12 that he had and the difficulty with keeping 12 united. And they had Jesus with them, physically, in the flesh, with them. And still, with that 12, that group, there was always like, stop debating who's going to be great. You guys, come on, look at what I'm doing. Uh, wow. I mean, but he, that was trouble when he was there physically, working through the guys. But he's not here physically. He's got his Holy Spirit here, and he's working through us. He's, unity is a challenge. Unity takes work. We need to be unified. That's what Jesus is praying for. And he tells us the reasons why unity is important. He asks that all believers may be in the Father and in the Son, that the world might believe that he was sent. When the world sees a church united, they're like, wow. Wow. That's something. Because the world is divided. Is this not a divided world on every issue imaginable? Let's not even talk about it. We might divide over it. It's happening everywhere. Everything's polarized. Everything's divisive. Oh, what do you, well, I don't know about that. Well, I don't believe about like that. Well, did you read this thing? Did you see that tweet? Did you brush it? No, I didn't. Then I disagree with you. Okay, fine, whatever. You know, there's always these things. I, I guarantee you, if we were to poll the audience, and we won't. <laughs> we will not do that. Well, what do you think about? And oh, I, okay, well, I'm not, you would move on the side there, or you wouldn't come back. You know, it was just a lot of polarizing issues. So unity takes work, and that's what Jesus was praying for. He wanted them to be united. And Christian unity, it is a virtue. And at the same time, there are certain things that limit unity. There's certain things that we, we have to be united on and other things that, that we can't, no matter how ecumenical you want to become, we do not unite on that. There are certain things, certain Christian doctrines that are non-negotiable, and if we don't have unity on this, in the name of love, we don't have unity on these things. So there's certain things that, that work toward unity and other things that we divide over that, that are important. But, but listen, we need to learn to find things to agree on with people that we don't agree on in the non-essential issues of the Christian faith. And, and there are essentials, and then there are non-essentials. In the non-essentials, there should be charity, working toward unity. In the essentials, there has to be unity, or there isn't any. And this is something that you learn to work through uh, with so many different denominations and different... Uh, approach, I suppose, or philosophy of ministry even, and, and how, do you, how do you unite on these things? And again, when, if there's a place or there's a group that is teaching a different gospel, uh, yeah, there's no unity. If they're teaching something contrary to Scripture, we are not united. We need to pray for them. If someone is living in a continual, unrepentant, persistent sin, it's really difficult to be united with them. In fact, the Bible talks about that and how to address that particular issue or false teachers or those that cause division. One, you know that one of the things God hates is division. Hates it. And he doesn't like people who start it. And there are some people, that's, they think that's their ministry. I have a gift. What is it? Division. Like, <laughs> that's not a good thing in here. Uh, that's not good. But it seems like everywhere they go, there's some divisive thing. It's like it follows them like a, like a trail. Like, hey, what, what happened over here? Oh, so-and-so came over. Where did they go? Oh, they're over there. And then, you, and then it happens there. And then they move. They kind of, you know, make their way through the body and, and do these things. And the Bible talks about them. They're called busy bodies. Busy bodies. And they, they like to cause division. God says, I hate division. I hate what it causes. I hate that kind of stuff. And if God hates it, well, surely we should hate it. We need to be united. And, you know, heaven's going to be amazing because in heaven, we're all going to be perfect. And we will be totally united. Uh, completely. There's no division in heaven. It's not going to be there. There's not, it's not compartmentalized, you know. This group's over here. This group checks in. Calvary Chapel, yeah, you guys are in the back. You guys are in the back, you know, of heaven. You know, like we just compartmentalize. Hey, this is this group, you know, that church over there and that church over there. We, listen, the, the less denominational you are, you know, the more loving you should be. And, and my pastor used to say that God uses different churches to minister to all different kinds of people. And, and I need to be aware of that. That they're the body of Christ. And just because they don't meet here doesn't mean they're not part of the family. 
and, and God works in their lives and God works in our lives. Of course, there are certain things, again, that are non-negotiable, and we need to be clear on that. But then there are other things that we need to work toward uh, unity. For example, let me just give you some examples. These are real-time examples. And that is, you think about the vaccine. This is, this is a divisive, very divisive issue. We all have our opinions on it. And we could all say, and even now, you're like, okay, what's he going to say? I'm ready. <laughs> You know, you're, you're pumped, you know? You got your opinion, so do I. And, um, and we all need to do our research. We all need to pray. We all need to seek the Lord. I know where I stand on the issue, and most of you do too. But if you come to this church, and it's really none of our business, let's just make that clear. It's really none of our business. If you, if you want I mean, if you want to get it, go ahead. That's up to you. I wouldn't. I just told you my opinion. I wouldn't. <laughs> that's me. You're not me. And good for you, you're not me. <laughs> but that doesn't, I'm not divided over that. I love you. I, if you. Hey, that's between you and Jesus. It's between me and Jesus. I'm not doing it. No way. And I, have, I know too much. I've had firsthand personal testimony. Not like, hey, did you hear about? No, actually from the source itself. So I'm good. I'm good, but I understand the challenges that people are facing. We cannot divide over that. We can't. And then, of course, there's a mask. <laughs> How do you feel about it? <laughs> Obviously, I, <laughs> I don't. I hate them. Sorry, if you wear one and you feel compelled to do it, I love you. You come here. If you, and if you wear one, it's okay if you want to. That's an, entirely up to you. I, I, and some of you guys, you go to work and you have to wear them all day. It's like, that's why you're so happy at church. You're like, hey, <laughs> look at, look at me. I have teeth, you know. <laughs> I can breathe. And I feel for you guys. And I pray for you guys. And I know how hard it is to be in that environment and have to day in and day out go through that. And, and yet, if people come in here and they have it, you know what? Hey, praise the Lord, man. I, I love you. If you, you know, whatever. And, and I think there's, those are just real time things that, that we kind of go through in, in this, in the immediate moment. There are other things that we could go down the line on, but we need to work toward unity. And there are things that come into the church sometimes that, you know, they're very divisive in the world, but then they try to make their way into the church. And this is a, this is a constant, constant battle that we face and we work toward unity. And, um, you know, Love covers a multitude of disagreements and, and opinions that they don't have any eternal consequence. They're not salvific issues. They're not eternal issues. They're just things that we have differing opinions on. And so we need to work toward unity and love in that regard. And the Lord honors that. And that was the prayer of Jesus. And so he goes on to say in verse 23, I and them, you and me, that they may be perfect in one and that the world may know that you sent me and have loved them as you've loved me. Verse 24, Father, I desire that they also, whom you gave me, may be with me where I am, and that they may behold my glory, which you've given me, for you've loved me before the foundation of the world. What a prayer request. He just said, Father, I'm praying that they would be with me. And that they would see my glory. Hey, one day that prayer request is going to be answered when we're with the Lord and we get to see his glory. Isn't it wonderful that Jesus prayed that? Lord, I want them to be with me. I, I desire them to be with me. Even after all that God knows about us, who we are, what our struggles are, what our hangups are, who, you know, all of that, I want them for eternity. You know, eternity is forever, right? Like forever, forever? Yeah, forever. I want them with me. I want him to see my glory. You know, today we talked about heaven this morning as we were looking at what it's going to be like in that celestial city. What's it going to be like to, to walk in and just to hear the praises and the hallelujahs and see the glory of God, no, no longer the sun or moon, just God's glory, just illuminating. What's it like for our loved ones who are already there in the city, dwelling with the Lord, and we're going to be there. Oh, Jesus said, I want them to be with me. I want them to see my glory. And one day that prayer will be answered. Verse 25, O righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I've known you. And these have known you that you sent me. 
Verse 26, and I have declared to them your name and will declare it that the love with which you loved me may be in them and I in them. This was the prayer of Jesus. I've declared to them your name. I've revealed who you are. I've shown them your love. You've loved me, or you, which you love me, maybe in them and I in them. It's rather intimidating, truthfully, when you approach, how do you comment on the prayer of the Son of God? <laughs> it, it speaks for itself. It's, almost, it's very, what am I going to break down your prayer? For the people, and then when I get there, like you, that was not what I meant with that. <laughs> That's not what I said. <laughs> like, oh, those are all red letters. That's all Jesus right there. Listen, I hope that you were able to see the heart of God. He prays for himself, he prays for the apostles, and then he prayed for us. And his desire that it was that we would be with him forever. And folks, this prayer will be answered. I just made note tonight, just a couple of notes, like the thing, how many times Jesus said, I have, I have, I have, I have, I have. It's repeated. Verse four, I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work you gave me to do. Verse six, I have manifested your name. Verse eight, I have given to them the words you've given me. Verse 14, I have given them your word. Uh, Verse 22, and the glory which you gave me, I have given them. And I have declared your name. I mean, just all the things you said, this is what I did, this is what I did, this is what I did, this is what I did. I did all of these things so that they would know who you are. Jesus has done everything, guys, necessary for us to have a relationship with God. And here he prays for us. And tonight, no matter what situation you're in, whether the enemy is desiring to sift you like wheat, Jesus is praying for you. Maybe there is something tonight that is so troubling You were barely able to make it here tonight. He's praying for you. He's interceding on our behalf because he loves you. And one day, wow, we're going to be in glory with him. We'll put on the brakes for just a minute or two. Pastor John Randall will share the rest of his message on the prayer of Jesus momentarily here on A Daily Walk. As we leave you today, we'd like to say how much it means to us each and every time we hear how God is at work in our listeners' lives. And it would be so encouraging to hear from you. So please write today while it's fresh on your mind. Our email address is a dailywalk at gmail.com. You can call us toll free at 877-242-0828. That's also the number to call if you'd like a copy of today's message. We can send that to you for a cost of just $5. Again, reach us at 877-242-0828. You can also visit our website to listen to today's message at adailywalk.org or wherever you get your podcasts. And we're also on oneplace.com. You may recall in 1 Timothy chapter 4, which says, Some people in the last days will depart from the faith giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. So how do we discern truth from culture's lies? We've got a book to recommend to you that can help. It's from Jack Hibbs, entitled Living in the Days of Deception. It's our featured resource this month at A Daily Walk. The cost is just $10, so maybe get an extra copy or two to give away. Call 877-242-242. 0828 or go to a dailywalk.org for easy online ordering. Here at a daily walk we look to the Lord to provide for and sustain us. Now we know these are difficult and challenging financial times for many of you. But if God has blessed you with a little extra this month, we'd very much appreciate your support. It would be wonderful to hear from you right now. We've tried to make it easy to make a donation online at a dailywalk.org or call us at 877-242-0828. And there are some other ways we can stay connected. Check out Pastor John on Twitter and Instagram for biblical encouragement throughout the week. Follow him on Twitter at PJRandall7 and on Instagram at John P. Randall. To finish things up now in prayer, here's John. Shall we pray together? Heavenly Father, we do thank you tonight for this high priestly prayer. Lord, you put us in this world for a season that we might be sanctified, set apart, and live for your glory. Lord, I think about also um, 
just that, that request of the disciples when they said, Lord, teach us to pray. But it seems like one of the, the biggest struggles that we have sometimes is just to, to pray. So Lord, I pray as we go into a new week that we would just talk to you and listen to you and cultivate and develop a life of prayer, waiting on you, being still. Lord, your word says that when we go into the, the secret place and we shut the door and we pray to our Heavenly Father in secret, that, Lord, you hear us and you, and you answer us. Lord, help us to, to frequent that secret place this week, Lord, wherever that might be. Thank you for hearing us, God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We'll have the rest of this message for you tomorrow on A Daily Walk. We're going through the Bible with John Randall. Don't miss a moment of the journey. This program is made possible through your generous support and brought to you by Calvary South O.C.,